Hey, y'all stand to your feet with me. I want to read a little passage of Scripture together before we start. I think God's Word deserves us standing for as we begin this morning. Brand new series, brand new month starting off, brand new topic of conversation. So starting in Luke chapter 6, the words of Jesus, He says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Father, as we read these words, I ask the Holy Spirit of God that you would put our thoughts, put our mind on a rail that runs parallel with your mind. God, take us where you would have us to go. Show us the things that are of you. And God, show us how you would have us to, to worship you, to interact with you, to follow you. Thank you for the word that you were about to present to us today. And I ask that you would put power into it, Father. Bring application in our lives as we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shake hands with somebody. Welcome somebody to church this morning before you grab a seat there. All right, as you guys are finding your seat there, I want to remind you that tonight at 6 p.m. we're having our, our second uh, night of worship, and so our worship team is going to have the stage. And Yeah, come on, let's thank our worship team. Yeah, let's be excited about what they're going to do tonight. Amen. Amen. I always love these guys leading us in worship. And you know, man, Sunday mornings, sometimes it just doesn't seem like, like three songs is enough. And so we're going to gather together tonight. And as a, as a church, they're going to lead, but we're going we're gonna to sing along with them. And we're going to worship God. Uh, we're just going to lift up our hearts. And so I would really encourage you, as the day goes along today, uh, first of all, make plans to be here at 6 is when it will start. So get here a little bit early so you can get your coffee and find you a good seat and then make sure that you're bringing somebody with you somebody that you think could use a little encouragement and a lifting of the heart so that starts tonight this morning you see the title of the of the series is called return to sender that will make sense as we go along but but this morning i want to talk to you from a, a message that i'm calling a matter of the heart a matter of the heart and so i'm going to tell you up front this is something that that i've never done before um, I made a phone call to Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas, where Robert Morris is the pastor. And Gateway Church is a huge, huge, you know, front end, one of those probably top 10% churches in the country. Huge church. Robert Morris has written many books and, and, and very renowned pastor. And so he wrote a book a few years ago called The Blessed Life, The Blessed Life. And, and I really encourage you to pick it up and read it. Great book. Um, but... He taught a series of messages. Matter of fact, as I've heard him speak this, this series, he said he teaches this to his church about every three years. And so as I heard uh, him speaking these messages, I was just so impressed with the way that, that he laid things out. I called Gateway Church, and I told them, I said, I'm a pastor of a church in Danville, Virginia, and I love the way this is laid out. Uh, I would love to be able to present this to our congregation just like Pastor Robert has. Would that be okay? Because I don't want to get into any plagiarism or stealing somebody else's sermons, all of that. They said that would be fine. We would love for you to do that. And so I'm telling you that this morning because, you know, you know, from time to time, man, people come up with stuff and say, oh, okay, that Compassion Network, they must send Jeff his sermons and tell him what to preach. Not true. Every week, man, we're getting before the Lord, praying, God, what do you want me to preach? Matter of fact, six months ahead of time, uh, we're getting together with another group of pastors. Two times a year, we get together and spend the better part of a week praying about what God would have us to speak months down the road. And then as time comes close, we plan those messages. And so every compassion pastor is preaching their own messages. I want you to know that just to clear up any any questions about that, but I also want you to know that this message and this series, I'm lifting it straight out of the pages of the blessed life, and I want you to know that. Um, it impacted me so much. And I want to say to you this morning that this, this message, this series, um, whenever it comes to talking about money in church, I've talked to so many people, heard from so many people who have been, been 
hurt by churches that have taken advantage of them from a financial situation, uh, churches that have just really seemed like we're just out to get all that we can get. And I want you to know from my heart, if you've been with me for a while, hopefully you, hopefully you have some measure of, of trust in me. I hope you do. But I want you to know from my heart to yours that, that I've probably prayed over this series of messages that we're going into for three weeks now, more than any other series throughout the year. Part of that is because I never want to, I never want to make you feel like you've been approached by a greasy salesperson that's just trying to get something from you. But more than that, I want you to understand that this message, this series on giving, it's really not about money as much as it is about your heart and, and, and your heart connecting with God. And like we talked about with the 10 lepers, it's, it's a heart of gratitude and understanding how Jesus wants his followers to operate within that. I want you to get what God wants you to get out of this. And so we're talking about a matter of a heart. Um, here's the thing, man. When, when, when God has your heart, when he has your whole heart and everything in you is leading to God, when he's leading and you're following him in every area of your life, your marriage, your parenting, your career, your finances, your future, your health, when you're letting him lead in all of those areas, he is so much more capable of leading than you are of drawing up a plan. Um, so that's where we're going. I want to go back now and start off with the passage we just read from Luke chapter 6. Then in a few minutes, we're going to go over to Deuteronomy. We're going to see some words from there. But in Luke chapter 6, I want to begin right here in verse 37. Now, pay attention to this verse, Luke 6, 37. Jesus says, do not judge. And what will happen, church, if you don't judge? Do not judge in what? You will not be judged. He says, do not condemn. And what will happen, church? you will not be condemned. Forgive, and what will happen, church? Now, did he say anything about money in any of that? You didn't see money mentioned anywhere. He said, he said, he said don't judge, and, and judgment won't be given back to you. Don't be a person who condemns others, and condemnation won't come back to you. And he says, do forgive people, and forgiveness will come back to you. Now, what he's saying, it's not about money, it's about these things. And what he's saying is what you give is what you're going to receive. So Jesus didn't talk about money in verse 37. Now, let's tie verse 38 on to that. So verse 38, he says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure. What's a good measure? Well, if you, if you buy a bushel of barley, you want to make sure that you're putting that bushel basket up on the scale. How much does the basket itself weigh? Okay, we're going to tear that out. We know how much that weighs. Now we're going to pour what is equal to a bushel into that. So we're going to have a good measure, a full bushel. Now we're going to press that down. We're going to shake it together. We're going to pour some more on it, and it's going to be running over. And that's what's going to be poured into your lap. In other words, you're going to get more than you even bargained for. And he says it will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use... It will be measured to you. Now, if, if you've ever heard this passage preached, you've probably heard it preached in the context of money. Give money, and you'll get money back. But that's not what Jesus said. He never used the term money here. He said, he said don't condemn people, right? Uh, he said, don't judge people, <coughs> and don't hold forgiveness against people. When you give, it's going to come back to you in a better measure than what you've poured out. What's Jesus saying? Well, what he's saying is whatever you give, there's a principle that says it's going to come back to you. So, so if you give hospitality, maybe you're not a hospitable person by nature, but maybe God is impressing upon you to open your home to people and allow people to come in and share a meal with someone. You give hospitality, guess what's coming back to you? You're going to find hospitality. If you give your time, maybe time is more important to you than money, and you don't have time to, to, to do this and this and this. But God says when you give time, guess what comes back to you? Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over, poured into your lap. He says if you give love, love will come back to you. So let me ask you a question. What is it that you need in your life? Do you need friends? Then be a friend. If you need love, be someone who shows love to other people. Do you need compassion shown to you? Then be compassionate. Do you need health in your life? Then help other people to be healthy. And Jesus says it's a matter of your heart. But unfortunately, that's not really the way we're wired, is it? That's not the way most of us are wired. We're not wired to give me away. Say, how do you know that, Jeff? Go right down the hallway there. The kids department, right down the hallway. Come on, somebody. 
It's a kid, I guarantee you, in one of those classrooms right now, there's a Tonka toy or a Lincoln log or a ball or something, and that kid has decided, mine, 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 mine. And another kid wants to play with something else. Well, this doesn't look as good as it did a minute ago. Let me put this down. And this kid will go over and snatch it out of this kid's hand. This kid who had it and was playing with it looks at this kid. <laughs> and kid A is now saying, mine, 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 mine. That's the way that we are wired. We are wired with mine, mine, mine. We're taught, though, that mine is not socially acceptable, but it still hangs out right beneath the surface, doesn't it? Well, so how do we change from being mind motivated to being give motivated? Now, this is where we go back to the Old Testament. We're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy, which is one of the first five books of the Bible. And if you're, if you're not really all that familiar with the Bible, the way it's laid out, if you just start on the, the front end of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book. And in those fifth book, or those five books, it's called the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. And it's the law that God gave to Moses is where that's found. And so when we go to Deuteronomy, we're seeing the law that God gave to Moses. Well, what do I make of that? Well, I'll just keep this brief. There's a lot that you can make of that. But what this, this law that God gave to Moses that we're going to read about in Deuteronomy, one of the things that we find is that God created this law to give to his people. And remember, he, he rescued his people, the people who were descendants of Abraham. God had promised them that he would be their God and they would be his people, and he would, he would put his mark upon them. And so he moved them from Egypt to a promised land that he had given them. And when he got them to the promised land, now, now they've come to the land that would become Israel. He says, okay, now I'm going to give you a system of law. And this system of law that I'm giving you is a system that, that will, will, will help you to be people who live a good life. And all the nations around you that look at you, if you live according to my law, will see that your life is good. Matter of fact, it will be better than their life. And he tells them, if you live this way, you'll be blessed. And if you don't live this way, you'll be cursed. And so that's in the, in the law of Moses. And what did Jesus say? So Jesus comes along, and I think it's in Matthew 5. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law. In other words, I didn't come to, to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. And when Jesus was saying this word in Matthew 5 about fulfilling the law, what he's saying is, is the law requires that when there's sin, there has to be a sacrifice. Well, I'm going to fulfill the law because I'm not going to sin. I'm going to be born of a virgin. I'm going to go to a cross, and one time for all, I will pay the price for sin, and everyone who chooses to receive me will be able to receive salvation. He said, I came to fulfill the law, and he would do that later. We know what would happen at the cross. But did Jesus come to abolish the law? Well, no, he didn't, because the law, as it was given, was good, and it was God's plan for how people were to live. And so when we go back into Deuteronomy, what you're going to see now, even though it's from the Old Testament, there's a principle here, and the principle is that, that God wants to tell you how to live a good life how to live a blessed life, how to live a life where you have more than you need, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I want to show you four things from Deuteronomy 15. Here's the first thing. Deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a selfish heart. So Deuteronomy 15 is where we're going to hang out for the remainder of our time, starting at verse 7. It says, if there is a poor man among your brothers. Now, that word brothers is important. These are people who, who are, are family. When I say family, we're talking Christian family in our context, people who are, who are fellow believers. In, in, in Moses' day, the brothers would be those who were descendants of Abraham, uh, other Jewish people, um, people of their tribe, of their community. If there's a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God has given you, don't be hard-hearted. Don't be tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Verse 8, rather... Be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will towards your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Now let's talk about this just a minute. In the middle of that whole passage, he says, he says don't think in your mind that the, the seventh year, the year of canceling debts is coming, so I'm not sure I want to do this. Y'all, if you've never read through the Old Testament, if you've never read through, through the law of Moses, one of the things that I find fascinating, 
God set up a financial system for Israel where there would be no poor people in, in, in his people. There would be no poor people. You say, how does that work? Well, if you've ever heard the word jubilee, there, the word jubilee comes from that Old Testament law. And so, so God said there would be a year of jubilee. And so every seventh year is called the year of jubilee. And in that seventh year, every debt is canceled. Somebody say, huh, amen, give me some of that, right? Somebody got a $300,000 mortgage right now that you're about $82 into paying for, and you are looking for that seventh year. Yes, yes. Every seven years, the debt would be canceled, and they would start all over. So if you were poor, you ain't going to be poor but seven years, right? That's the most you would, you would stay broke, because in that seventh year, all of your debts are canceled. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, suppose that someone in your community, someone, that, someone that, that, that's, a, that's a friend of yours, a brother, another Christian, someone you go to church with, they're struggling. And you look at them, you say, man, they're really having a hard time. And they can't make ends meet. Now, this isn't always about people squandering their money on things, right? I mean, we get it that, that life happens. Anybody ever had a bad situation in your life and you didn't know how you were going to make it for a period of time? One, two, three, there we go, come on, right. I mean, man, things happen. You have a car wreck and you can't go to work and you're out of work for a time or, or you're a farmer and the crops don't come in or whatever and you're struggling. And so in this passage, what he's saying is, is when, when you see someone that's, that's among your people and they're really struggling to make it and they need some money from you and you have money that you can help them with, he's saying don't look at them and say, oh, no, I don't know, I don't know that I want to help them. He says... He says, have an open hand. He says, have an open heart. Do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. He says, rather be open-handed and freely lend him what he needs. Be open-handed and freely need, lend him what he needs. And he says this. I find this so interesting. God knows how our crooked, little, twisted, janked-up minds work, doesn't he? He said, don't you be looking at that thinking, well, the year of Jubilee is just around the corner. If I lend this man $3,000, and that's what he needs to make it and to set everything up. But he only has six months until Jubilee comes. He's not going to be able to pay it back. Then I'm going to lose my money. He says, don't worry about that. Give it anyway. Have compassion upon this person, whether they can pay it back or not. Uh, what? Do what? Do what, Lord? That's what he says. He says, don't worry about that Jubilee thing coming up. Be careful not to harbor this thought. Seventh year, year for canceling debts is near, so that you don't show ill will and give him nothing. Because... He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you'll be found guilty of sin. So he's saying, when you see need, and you have the ability to meet that need, do it. It's simple. Don't be selfish. Help others. Now, here's the second thing. It goes right along with it. Deal with a grieving heart. Deal with a grieving heart. Deal with a grieving heart. Um, grief, is a, grief is an interesting thing, and we typically equate grief with death and loss. But grief is not always about death. It's not always about the loss of a loved one. You can, you can go into grief when you lose your job and you worked with these people for 15 years and now you don't see them anymore. You can go into grief when, when you sell this house and you made a decision to sell it and you moved to this house, but now you're grieving because you miss where you were. Grief shows up in lots of ways. Well, look at what, what, what God says to us in Deuteronomy 15.10. Continuing that thought, he says, Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. So there's a command here. God says to do things. Do two things. He says, number one, give generously to him. And number two, he says, do so without a grudging heart. Or some translations say a grieving heart. Um, it's not, it's, it's, don't, don't, don't give to him, say, man, I'm going to give him this money because it really hurts my heart that, that he's struggling and I see those little kids and I don't really want to give it, but nobody else is saying, I'll give it to him. I'll shoot. What does the Bible say? The Lord loves a cheerful giver. How, come on, raise your hand if you're always cheerful when you give. You better put your hands down, y'all. Uh, <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful heart. But it's not just a command that tells you what to do. It's also a command that tells you what will happen when you do. What does it say? It says he will bless you if you do this. If you give generously with an open hand, he will bless you in everything you put your hand to. Could be monetarily. It may not be. It may not be monetarily. It may be that he blesses you in other ways. 
You say, well, man, that's hard. I, I, I might not want to give generously to someone who's struggling. Kaidra, I just remember something. I'm supposed to take a family out to lunch today, and I, I left my wallet at home, and I, I need about $100. Can you let me, you guys? Hundo right there, baby, get you some of that. Thank you, Kaidra. You know why it was so easy for Kaidra to give that to me? Because I gave it to her before the service started. <laughs> when it doesn't belong to you to start with, it doesn't hurt your heart to give it away. Do you see where I'm going with that? She didn't go out and, and, and break rocks and lay brick and, and work for eight dollars an hour to get that hundred dollars and hold on to it squeezing it because she knew how hard it was to get i took her backstage and hey i'm gonna give you this give it back to me when i call you up and don't you hold on to my money don't make me come chase you <laughs> i just knew i was gonna look down there and kaiju was gonna be gone when the service started no my point is, is very simple the money that you have the money that 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 is in your account where did it come from God gave you the breath in your lungs to breathe. God gave you the job to go out and get it. God gave you the ability to save. And so, so it's all his. He's just letting you hold on to it. And when he says, see this person that's over here that's struggling, that's my kid. I love my kid. My kid's struggling. And here's two things that's going to happen. Number one, I'm going to help my kid by getting you to give them money. And when you have faith in me to help my kid, then I'm going to bless you with more than what you had to start with. Oh, man. I love that, man. But, but what do we do? Mine, 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 mine. It's the way we're wired, isn't it? Um, when you realize that every dollar that you have belongs to God, and he gave it to you so you could do good with it, here's what happens. Instead of avoiding people that you see that might want a dollar from you, instead of staying out of situations where I'm not going to that thing because they're going to ask me for money, God will create this thing in you that, that, that says, God, there's a part of what you've given me that I want to use to help other people. We all laugh when we were kids. When How's that saying go? It's more blessed to what? More blessed to give than it is to receive. Christmas time, you'll hear that. And, and when we were kids, we're like, no, it ain't. No, it ain't. No, it is not. I want to get, get, get. Give me some more mine, mine, mine. But when you do get to the other side of that thing, man, and you, you get the opportunity to help someone and to bless someone and they were struggling. And you release that, that money and you see them now not struggling. And you don't want anything back from them. You don't want them to tell anybody you did it for them. You just want them to be well and to be blessed. Man, it puts a thing in your heart that you can't find anywhere else. So let's talk about how do we develop a generous heart. How do we develop a generous heart? So go back to Deuteronomy 15. Verse 14 says, supply him. We're talking about the same guy. We're going we're gonna, to we're help this guy who's struggling. We're not going to worry about the seven years. We're not going to worry if we don't get our money back. Supply him liberally. How does it say to supply him, church? Liberally. That means don't give him what he needs. Give him more than he needs. This man's saying, man, my crops didn't come in. My family doesn't have any food. If you would just give me like $500? I know that's a lot, but $500 would get me through this season. I think I'd be okay. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Now, I've never seen any one of y'all that has a flock or a threshing floor or a wine press, but you have a savings account, or you have a checking account, or you have a Bitcoin or something, whatever. It says, give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. He's saying when you see that person that's struggling, open up your heart. And help them. And if you think, if they say, man, $500 might get me across the finish line, give him $2,000. Say, Jeff, what are you talking about? It's just numbers. I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. What I'm saying is if you have the ability to help this person more than what they need, God says supply him liberally. He says give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. It's a problem that we all have so often is that we fall into this trap of living with a scarcity mindset, a scarcity mindset. Instead of, instead of 
seeing ourselves as a vessel that God wants to pour into, right? When, when you see yourself as this big funnel at the top, and God is going to pour into you, and when God sees that when he pours financial resources into your life, that you look for people who are struggling, you look for ministries that are bearing fruit, you look to, to, to do the things that God calls you to do, and you say, I'm going to send some here, and I'm going to send some here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some to that one. That funnel stays open at the top. But when you decide that God's poured into me, and it's shoop, I'm going to lock that thing up at the bottom. It's all mine, mine, mine. Then why would God pour one more penny into your funnel? We live with a scarcity mindset, and we cut off the flow of the resources that God wants to give us. And in doing so, we cut off the blessings that God wants to give us. In do Some of us are living lives that are hard right now, and our hearts are cold, and our hearts are hardened, and we're holding on so tightly to what we've gotten. And maybe you would say, Jeff, you don't know how hard I have to work for my money. Jeff, I came from nothing. My family didn't have anything, and now I've got a little something, and I don't want to let go of it. But are you reading the Word of God? The Word of God says that if you let it go, if you invest, I will give seed to the sower. I'm not going to give seed to the one who holds on to the seed. I'll give seed to the sower. And when you invest and when you help other people, then God's going to bless you. God's going to bless you. I told you all this story a few weeks ago, but some of you may not have heard this. A few weeks ago, there was a, a group of us that went down to Florida to help out with Hurricane Ian with God's pit crew. And I, it still just blows me away. I love this story, and I don't mind sharing it a second time. Because as we were going, we stopped at a gas station on the way down, and this lady comes walking across to one of, the, one of our vehicles, and she goes over and tells the guy that's driving the car, hey, I see all the God's pit crew stuff on your vehicle. I want to I pay for your gas. We were like, wow, that's so cool. So she pays for the gas. They pump the thing, and she's walking by me a few minutes later. I said, ma'am, that was so cool. I sure do appreciate what you did. And so she stops and engages me for a moment. We have this conversation. And she says, she says, I love to be able to do this. I thank you for what your, your group is doing. And, and I just want to bless other people. She said, the way that I look at my interaction with God and giving, she said, it's like this. It's like I love ponies. And my dad, my father God, owns all the ponies. And so he's given me a pony. But I see somebody else that doesn't have a pony and they want one. So I just give them mine because I know that I can go back to my father and he'll give me another one. And I see somebody else who wants a pony and doesn't have one, so I give them that one and I go back and he gives me another one. And I thought, what a perfect illustration. She finishes telling that story. We're all standing around talking. I look back a few minutes later. Lady is standing there in her car with a gentleman and they're looking at a weed eater. Brother takes off with the weed eater and she has a handful of $20 bills, comes over and hands me four $20 bills. She says, this is for you. This is for you. What did she do? She just gave away another pony. She just gave away another pony, and now she's going to get another one. That's that mindset that God's going to do what God says he'll do. That's that mindset that the sooner I let go of this one, he's going to bring another one back to me, and it's not for me. See, when you're a Christian, when you're a follower of Jesus, you realize that your life is not about you. It's not about me. It's about God's glory. And it's about helping other people around us. And he wants to use you to do that. But we have to develop a generous heart. And she did. She knew how to do that thing, man. Last thing is develop a grateful heart. Develop a grateful heart. Deuteronomy 15, verse 15. This is such a sobering verse of Scripture. He says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. Who's God talking to? Well, he's talking to people who had descended from those people, those, those descendants of Abraham who had ended up in slavery in Egypt and they had no way of getting out. And through God's mighty hand, through a series of plagues, huh, how many plagues were there? 10. Once again, there's that term 10. 10 is a term of, of testing. And through that testing of Pharaoh's heart, God chose one of, those, one of those 10 that he would use to set his people free. And, and so what he's saying in Deuteronomy is you once were slaves in Egypt, but God looked at you and in compassion, he poured out his love on you. He poured out his favor and he set you free. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that God has set free from who you used to be. Anybody want to just give God glory right now? Give him a little hand clap of praise.
He says, remember you were slaves in Egypt. You had no way of getting out. When I contextualize that in my own life, it doesn't take me long to look back over the last number of years and see how God has provided everything that we have. Like from a church standpoint, it's only been 10 years since this church started. I had zero dollars to start a church with. I had a dream in my heart and I feel like God put that there. I feel like God gave us a vision to start a church. And God provided the money and God provided the people and God provided the place and God provided everything that was needed. We didn't have guitars, we didn't have drums, we didn't have lights, we didn't have anything. And God provided all of that. We started a church and people started coming. Look at this building you're sitting in right now. Most of you probably never sat in our little storefront church that we were in before we moved here over on Deer Run Road, a little place that would seat about as many people as, as is available right here. Maybe a little bit more, but a couple hundred people was the most they would seat. We didn't have any money, and God provided this huge building for us. Why did he do that? Because he loves us, because he believes in us. He believes we're going to share this message with, with the community and with the world around us. But it's not just about the church. When I look at my own life, man, I look at how, how I've blown money so much. I look at how I've been so, so selfish at times. But I also look at times where God has said, first thing you do when you get paid is you give. First thing. More than the money, it's the first thing. Because that's where your heart is. When you, when you honor me with your first fruits, then I'm going to honor you. All I can tell you, church, I'm not going to go into that whole talk because this is not a get to give kind of a sermon. This is a we, 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 we get to give, right? We, we, we get to give to others. We get to be a blessing to others. And, and as God has allowed me and my family to give to the church and to give to other people, to help people, He's just blessed us over and over and over. Before I leave that thing about the church, I don't want to forget to say this. I don't know if y'all know this or not. Uh, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but the bathrooms out here that we just finished renovating, I don't know what the number is. I'm going to say somewhere around $75,000 is what it cost to do those renovations because there was so much concrete that had to be dug through and a lot of labor and plumbing and all of those things. I stood before you one Sunday morning and said, guys, there's people coming into our church that can't go to the bathroom because they're in a wheelchair, and that's not okay. We need to, we need to raise some money to do this. In my mind, I'm thinking we need to raise about $50,000. I don't know how we're going to do it. That very morning, I took the step of faith to say to you, we need to do this. That very morning, a lady walks up to me with her husband and says, my husband is a, is a certified plumber, and he would like to do the labor on this for you probably saved us $40,000 in him doing that. Another family that lays tile and does floor work, donated tile, came in week after week after week, putting down tile. So many people volunteered time. What happened? We saw a need, had compassion for the people who needed a bathroom to go to, said, God, we're going to trust you to do it, and he made it happen. The, another thing is going on, y'all probably don't even know about this. About a month ago, some guys showed up here on a Monday morning, went to work on the roof of this church, replaced all of the shingles on the roof of this church. Um, didn't cost us a dime. Insurance got involved, replaced all the shingles on the roof. Um, part of that project is, is they're looking at some other things outside. They're also looking at, at, at potentially painting the ceiling in here. Huge undertaking. Uh, it may be that we come back somewhere in the near future. We may have to move some of these pews so that we can get lifts in here so the guys can paint. I don't know how that's all going to work out, but I'm telling you that because everything within the scope of that, I've been told that that could potentially be a $250,000 project. You know how much we've paid on that and will pay on that? Zero dollars. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm telling you that because what I see is we collectively as a church, when we give, when we pour into this community, and we pour into missionaries that come in here, and we pour into the ministries of everything that happens, when we're doing God's work, He's going to take care of everything else that we need. And I see it firsthand in my life, and I see it in our church. And here's what I want to close with. Over the last few months, I've been talking to you guys about the pillars of our faith. And here's why. Look around, man. We're, 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 not, we're not 
you know, whatever you would think of as a traditional church that, that people have been going to that church for a million years. We're a collection of people that, that maybe have been to church for a while, maybe we've never been to church, maybe we didn't care about church, but we're a collection of people who, who maybe we don't have all of the pillars of the faith laid out. So I've been talking to you in, in recent months about, hey, let's get some of these foundational things down. Let's, let's go to church. Let's read our Bible consistently. Let's pray. Let's get connected in group. Well, you want to know what another um, pillar of the faith of a Christian is? I'm not talking about somebody who just wants to be a morally good person. I'm talking about somebody who's following Jesus. When you know what Jesus did on that cross and the price that he paid to redeem your life, and he says to you, part of following me is to give, to give to the work of the local church, then that's one of the pillars of our faith. So over the next few weeks, I'm unashamedly going to talk to you about what it looks like to give to the church. And I'm doing this not because I want something from you or need something. God provides everything we need. I'm doing this because what you're going to find is when you engage God through faith and giving, the way that he calls us to give, you're going to see him pour out his blessings on you. You're going to see, just like that one leper that said, thank you, Lord. When you really express your gratitude to him, you will feel the joy of the Father. But we don't get there by just doing what we want to do. We only get there by following God's instructions. So I want to pray with you before we close. You know, as you, as you sit there with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I've talked an awful lot about giving. Whatever it is that you need, give it away, all of those kinds of things. It reminds me of John 3, 16. Our God loves. What does he do as a response to his love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loved and he gave us Jesus. Let's make that personal. Almighty God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And his plan for your life is to put away whatever the devil is screaming into your heart right now. He wants to take away all of that anxiety and fear and worry. He wants to take away the past mistakes, and he wants to give you hope. He wants to give you purpose. He wants your life to have meaning. He wants your life to have joy. When I talk to you about tithing and offerings and giving and going and all of those things, what are you doing? When you do that, you're glorifying God. Whenever you give him glory, he always returns joy. But if you're not in a personal relationship with Jesus, and if you've never given your life to him, then you don't know the joy of the Father. That could all change today. God loved, so he gave. He gave his son Jesus, who, who died on a cross, and he's given everything that's needed for you to have salvation, for your future to be secure, and for you to find forgiveness. But you don't get that until you actually receive it. And so I want to make an invitation to you this morning, right there where you sit, nobody looking around. I'm not going to ask you this morning to come forward, anything like that. Just between you and God. God's saying to you right now, the price has been paid for your salvation. I'm pushing it into the middle of the table. Will you receive the gift of salvation? As you sit there right now, if you would say, Jeff, that's what I've been looking for my whole life. I want Jesus to save me. I want to give him my life today. Would you just raise your hand right now so I can see it? Jesus, I want you to save me today. I give you my life. Father, this morning, as we close, we thank you for your word that sharpens us. Thank you for your word that clarifies things. God, thank you that you show us that our lives are not about what we're doing today and this week and what we want and what we've got to give. But our lives, we exist for your glory. God, help us to focus on your glory. Help us to focus on following you as Christians, people who bear the name of Jesus Christ. God, help us to be more like you this week. Lord, we give you this message. We ask you to help us to apply it to our lives. Pray to bless your people as we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.